uh, young people, um, if you're a teenager uh, in year 7 to year 12, 13, uh, time to go to group. I think you're all going out that door over there. Um, great to see you all. How's everyone doing? It's good to see you. My name's Dave, one of the leaders here at Ascot Life Church. It's really um, good to see you. I've done something on my iPad and I can't turn it off now. Bear with me. Stop the video. Um, no? Okay. <laughs> Fine. We'll just go with it. Ah! Don't you just love technology when it works? Great. It's really good to see you this morning. Let me pray, and um, we'll get to work in, in the Word of God. Lord Jesus, we want to thank you that you're alive. We thank you for your loving kindness towards us. We thank you for your grace, uh, which we've been singing this morning. Lord, we thank you that grace isn't just a girl's name. Lord, it's a life-changing thing that impacts our whole world because of what you've done for us, because of your love for us. Thank you that even though we don't deserve it, you pour out your love towards us. You forgive us. You take us through those tough moments in life. And you have a hope for us, a promise for us. A promise that we'll be with you forever in glory, where we'll get to worship you, where we'll get to be together as your family. So we honour you and thank you. Amen. Amen. So um, if you're new or you're um, just sort of tuning in to Ascot Life Church, we're currently spending two years in the book of Romans. Uh, the book of Romans was not a book, it was a letter. It was a letter written by a man called Paul to a church in Rome. And so when you read your Bibles with all your headings and all the verse numbers, just remember that that wasn't there when Paul wrote that letter. Because I don't know about you, but I don't write an email with chapter one. A letter to the church. It wasn't there. It was a letter that Paul was writing to encourage the Christians um, in Rome, in the early church. And so we're spending time over the, these two years looking at this because it's an amazing, wonderful truth of the gospel. And if we want to be people who impact the world outside, we need to understand the impact that this good news has made on us. We need to understand the difference that the gospel and God's love makes in our lives every day. So we've been going through that and we've come to Romans chapter 8. And as Simon kicked us off last week, looking at the first four verses, um, talking about how some writers have called Romans 8, the, Romans 8's the peak of Romans. And some people would go as far as saying the peak of the Bible. It's such a wonderful, amazing uh, book, chapter full of truth. And so last week, Simon reminded us that we're free from two things. Firstly, we're free from condemnation. And we're also free from sin's power. That's our standing in Christ as his followers. We're free from condemnation. Stella prayed it earlier. When you understand that we're free from condemnation, that there's no guilt for those who are in Christ. That's our standing in, in him. It's really life-changing. And that we're also free from sin's power. Now, we might still get things wrong and stuff up from time to time, but sin has no power over the follower of Jesus. That's our standing in Christ, whether we believe it or not. I just encourage us to believe it to be true. That's who we are. And so as we're free from condemnation, we're free to, to do what? To live lives of obedience, uh, pleasing to God. That's what God has done for us in Christ Jesus. So that's what Simon introduced us to last week as we started looking at Romans chapter 8. And the logical question, I think, that this leads us to is this. So, if we're free to live an obedient, pleasing life to God, how do we do that? How do we live this obedient life that is pleasing to God? You see, I think that's an easier question to ask than it is to answer or to even live out. How do we live a life that's obedient to, to God? Should we even live a life that's obedient to God? And that 
asks the question, who's God? Who's Lord in your life? Is it Jesus or is it yourself? And so this question about how do we do this poses a challenge for us. How are we going to do this? The truth is that we are free from condemnation. But we can can feel condemned or guilty because we have an accuser. There is an enemy, Satan, who makes sure of this. I think Stella's word earlier about that, how we turn the dimmer to low because the enemy's putting lies in our minds. We just dim the switch. It's on, but we dim the switch. And he makes sure that we feel guilty and condemned. But friends, God declares us not guilty. He declares us free from sin, free from condemnation, because he took our sin upon himself on the cross. So the truth is, friends, we're free from sin's power. But I don't know about you, but I stuff up a lot. I fail. Is it just me? Oh. Like, oops, oops, I did it again. Even in our actions, but then in our mind, we believe lies and we believe things that are untrue. We fear, we doubt, we worry. We do things that we know, I shouldn't do that. But in the midst of that, I believe it's true that there is no condemnation and we're free from sin's power. So how do I work that out? It's not that we have to, friends, it's that we get to live a life that honours God. We get to live a life that's free from condemnation, free from sin, free from guilt, free from fear, free from in whatever you think holds you back. We're free from it. And we get to live a life that is pleasing and obedient to God. How cool is that? It's not like God's got our arm up behind our back making us do stuff. We get to do this as his children. And that is amazing. And the how we do this, that's where Paul takes us in today's next part of the text. Even when we feel like we can't do it in our own strength, Paul tells us how we can do it. Let's see what he has to say. I'm going to read before the screen comes up to remind us what Paul says in the first bit of Romans chapter 8, which Simon looked at last week. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those in Christ Jesus, because the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and death. What the law could not do since it was weakened by the flesh, God did. He condemned sin in the flesh by sending his own son in the likeness of of sinful flesh as a sin offering in order that the law's requirements would be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh but according to the spirit and we carry on for those who live according to the flesh have their minds set on the things of the flesh but those who live according to the spirit have their minds set on the things of the spirit now the mindset of the flesh is death. But the mindset of the spirit is life and peace. The mindset of the flesh is hostile to God because it does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it's unable to do so. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. You, however, are not in the flesh, but in the spirit, if indeed the spirit of God lives in you. If anyone does not have the spirit of Christ, he does not belong to him. Now, if Christ is in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the spirit gives life because of righteousness. And if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead lives in you, then he who raised Christ from the dead will also bring your mortal bodies to life through his spirit who lives in you. So then, brothers and sisters, we're not obligated to the flesh to live according to the flesh. Because if you live according to the flesh, you're going to die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. Wow. Just read Romans 8 and you go, wow. Wow. You see, because we have a new master, we're given a new mindset. 
And to show us what this mindset looks like, Paul compares two mindsets, two ways of thinking, two ways of looking out at things. The mindset of the flesh and the mindset of the spirit. Is your, is your mind set on the spirit or is your mind set on the flesh? And so we're going to look this morning at the mindset of the flesh, the mindset of the spirit, what that means for us in our standing with God, and also how we see that worked out in our lives day by day as followers of Jesus. And if you're someone who's investigating Jesus, you're um, wondering who this Jesus is that we've been singing about this morning, maybe a friend, you've come along with a friend this morning, and you're pondering what this is, this is a good way of looking in and seeing what As followers of Jesus, we believe about what he's done for us and who he's made us and how we can live that life for him. So, firstly, the flesh. What is the flesh? It's a funny word, flesh. You know the word incarnate? You know that comes um, in its original language, I think, in the Greek, incarnate. You know, anybody have chili con carne? That's like, carne is meat. It's like in flesh form. It's the, it's that in, and that's where we get the word carnal and carnality, our carnal desires, our fleshly desires, our human nature. And so the flesh is the, the, this worldly orientation of human beings. It's our natural state. It's our fallen state in our human sinful nature. Living as though God is not real and living with ourselves at the center of everything we do. I've said it before, we're really, really good at talking about ourselves. We've got a natural tendency to self, to to me. The whole world, doesn't it, revolves around me. That's our selfish human nature. And that's what the flesh is talking about here. That's what Paul's talking about. And he gives us a few of its characteristics. Paul gives us a few of its characteristics. Firstly, It leads us to live in a spiritual death. Not really alive. Living living life to the full that we're supposed to. Jesus came that we may live life and have it all in its fullness. And this fleshly way of living is is like we're in a spiritual death. We've, We've not got that access in the same way to our creator. Secondly, Paul tells us in verses 7 and 8, it leads us to... A life with hostility towards God and unable to please him. So the default nature of the fleshly life is hostility to the creator of the universe and an absolute inability to please him. And then thirdly, one of its characteristics, it leads us to, a, to live a life leading to actual death. Spiritual death is separation from God. Separation from the one who made us. Separation from one who made us in his image. Unless Jesus returns again before that day, the reality is, friends, we're all going to die. That's what life is. But actually, in Christ, there's a future hope, isn't there? There's something that, that changes that. But actually, we can still live this life alive, but dead to our creator. Spiritually dead, not alive in all that God has got for us. And these are some of the characteristics that Paul tells us about the flesh. So this is where our natural human nature leads us, to hostility towards God, to spiritual death, and all ultimately leading to physical death too. What does that look like? What does that look like day to day, knowing that we are separate from God or hostile to God? We just have to look world around us with hostility towards faith or to the fact that there's a God. People may be struggling with sickness and it's always amazing how people who don't believe in God suddenly blame God for sickness. Hostility because we always need someone to blame. It's a hostility in our human nature towards God and his ways and his purposes. We see that, don't we? Now, I don't know about you, as I was writing this and preparing this, I thought, sounds a bit gloomy, to be honest. And the reality is, friends, it is gloomy. 
It's not good news to live that way. That's, that's not the way God intended it. It was never God's ultimate plan for us to be at odds with him. He created us in his image to know him, to, to follow him, to be loved by him and to love him. You see, we were created to partner with him in stewarding creation and to live forever in his perfect creation. That's what we're here for. That's what God made us, to be a people amongst whom he could dwell. And the great thing is God had an answer, didn't he? He had an answer to the humanly, fleshly, fallen state of humankind. He had an antidote to living by the flesh. He had an answer. And that is the heart of all Paul has been saying. That when we believe this extraordinary message of the gospel, when we believe that Jesus is God, who was born as a baby, who lived a life without sin, who then took our place, on a cross, as he was put to death, taking our punishment, being a substitute for all the things that we've done in our lives, even the things we've ever thought, defeating the power of death, defeating the power of sin. Because he didn't stay dead, did he? He rose to life. He rose to life. And then when he rose to life, he then ascended to the Father's right hand in glory. And then he didn't just stay there, did he? He then sent his Holy Spirit to be God with us now that is the picture of what Jesus has done for us that's why we can live in Christ and this flesh the mindset can be put aside and we can we, li- we can live by the spirit you see as followers of Jesus friends we're called to be a people of the spirit we're called to be a people of the spirit to set our minds towards the spirit and have a mindset of the things of the Spirit, not just a mindset of God's grace and love and forgiveness, but He calls us to have a mindset on the Spirit. You see, it's by the power of the Spirit who sets us free. And we now walk and live according to the Spirit, not according to the flesh. You see, He's our new master who enables this holy life because he's replaced what we were subject to, which is the flesh. So, even though it sounds gloomy, Paul has good news for us. He says, you, you, however, now he's speaking to the, the Romans. I don't, th- I don't think Paul had us in mind, sat in Ascot on the um, 20th of October. But I think God had us in mind when he was inspiring Paul to write these things. But Paul's writing to the church in Rome, and we can take that on ourselves as well as followers of Jesus. He's saying, you are not in the flesh, but in the spirit, if indeed the spirit of God lives in you. In other words, the flesh no longer has power over you because you're in the spirit. You're out of the flesh. Now, it's a bit weird. This is that concept, concepts, flesh, spirit. Don't worry, we'll come to some ways of grounding that. But Paul is saying to the Christians, God is saying to us today, you're not in the flesh, you're in the spirit. And friends, I want to say to you, it's not one or the other. It's not a let's sit in both camps kind of decision or kind of truth. It's a one way or another. We can't be in both. We can't be in the flesh and in the spirit when it comes to our standing before Christ. Are we in? Are we his children? Or are we not? It's a complete change of position. It's a complete change of ruler. The king is different. We've got to live as a king. We need to live in the reality of this, friends, that we, as followers of Jesus, we've given our lives to follow him and no longer subject to the flesh. We live in the spirit. It's life-changing. We've come from darkness to light, death to life flesh to spirit. That's what God has done in us. And so you see a key part of becoming a follower of Jesus is receiving and continually being filled with the Holy Spirit. A key part of becoming a follower of Jesus is receiving and continually being filled with the Holy Spirit. 
cannot get away from that if you read anything in the New Testament. You cannot get away from that. See, Jesus said this to his disciples. If you love me, keep my commands. We talked about living an obedient life, didn't we, earlier? If you love me, keep my commands, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to help you and be with you forever, the Spirit of truth. The world cannot accept him because it neither sees him or knows him, but you know him, for he lives with you and he will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. Again, just amazing truth that we see here. Jesus is saying to his disciples, I'm not going to leave you. Even when I leave you, I'm not going to leave you. When I leave you, I'm going to send someone else who's going to be God with you. And I'm not going to leave you as orphans without a father or a mother or someone to look out for you. I'm going to be with you. Don't worry. And for some of us, this these moments of experience in the Holy Spirit, seeing him working in our lives. For some of us, those moments are dramatic. Wow. For others, not so much. Maybe it's just a feeling of assurance, of peace. God's working in you. Maybe it's an amazing experience of joy and laughter and happiness, speaking in a new spiritual language. It's all of the above. The Holy Spirit is God with us. And he wants us to know him. But the key is not how we experience the Holy Spirit. But the key truth is that the Spirit is the promise that Jesus wants for all of his followers, not just some of his followers. So what's so great about living by the Spirit? Well, Paul tells us. He tells us that he's a much better master who is the complete opposite of the flesh. This is what Paul says. The Spirit leads us to enjoy real, true life. Life comes by the Spirit, and it's only in that Spirit that we can have life in all its fullness, in the understanding of what God is doing and who God is. The Spirit enables us to live lives pleasing to God and at peace with him. Wow. So in the flesh, there's no way I can please God. In the Spirit, I'm pleasing to him. Do you know how amazing that is? Nothing you do, it's not about what you do either. It's about who you are. You are now his son and his daughter. He says, ah. He says something like, this is my son, this is my daughter, in whom I'm well pleased. That's what being in the Spirit means. And then he destines us not for a new life, not for a new life in your resurrected bodies after this life ends, not just for a new life. It's a life that is changing. He destines us for a future hope that doesn't just tie up with this world, but there's resurrected bodies. There's a place where there's no sin or sickness or suffering or death or pain or darkness, as we've been speaking about this morning. There's a place where there is hope. As Frank shared about about having faith to know God is, God is here and God is with us in the uncertainty of things. So I've titled this series, um, Living a Certain Life in the Spirit. You see, the Spirit brings certainty, brings confidence. And not in that this world will get sorted out, but there's a new heaven and a new earth and a future that's going to be so much more amazing without all these challenges that we face in this world. That is what he destines for, a life in the spirit now and forevermore. You see, his presence in us now is like a down payment of our future inheritance. It's like son, daughter, there's a place for you. That's your inheritance. You've got that coming. No one's going to take that away. That's coming for you. And friends, it's so amazing to live in the spirit. It's what we're created for, actually, to live lives in the Spirit, knowing God the Father, knowing Christ the Son, knowing the Spirit is God with us. That same Spirit that raised Christ from the dead that lives in us. 
That's what we're created for. So, how? So we want to know, how do we live this obedient life? So firstly, we realize we can't do it in our own strength. Because we're just going to fall short again and again. I've tried. It doesn't work. We've all tried, probably. It doesn't work. But we know that actually God gives us his spirit to help us. Gives us everything we need to, to life and live a holy life for God. So how, how do we live by the spirit? Firstly, this is what Paul tells us. Firstly, we need to stop living as if you're still obligated to the flesh. Literally, that's what Paul says. Because you're not. If you're a follower of Jesus, your position has changed. As Christians, living by the Spirit, we're free from the power or the obligation to flesh, to the flesh. But that doesn't mean we still aren't tempted to live that way. We're like maybe ex-prisoners that go back to the old habits of a life in captivity. But I would say, by knowing who we are and whose we are, we are able to put to death those old flesh habits that are no longer us anymore. We are able. We are able as those who live by the Spirit. It really is. I mean, it, it really, really is possible for us to say no to sin. It is possible. As we embrace the power of the Holy Spirit in our lives. Not by just saying, Maybe a picture would be one of the fruit of the Spirit is patience. Uh, maybe you're someone who's not very patient. Maybe you're really patient except when you're driving. And you're like, I will be patient. 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 And then someone cuts you off and you're beep. Oh, didn't do so well patient there. But that's what we're like. We live that way. But the work of the Spirit is not, I will be patient, I will be patient. The work of the Spirit is, Holy Spirit, work in my life. Holy Spirit, work in my life. Help me to react differently in that situation. So if you want to exhibit patience, don't just pray to be patient and try to be patient. Pray for the Spirit of God to work in your heart and in your life. Because then you'll become like him and that will work itself out. And you'll get there really is impossible to say no to those things. Just imagine a picture of a, a road. You've now, you've now, life is like you're, you're moving along a road and you're going down these little ruts and, and things and then you, you come to follow Jesus and it's like a new highway has been laid straight down. New life, life in the spirit and you're driving along and all of a sudden, you move to sort of the edge of the road, and there's one of those ruts that goes off, and you're like, oh, and it takes you off. You're like, oh, no, I need to get back over to the main road. You see, those things can take us. That's what it's like, because we do get things wrong. We do have those things that we have looked at in the past. I think of, I think of Rachel, who's just had a kidney transplant. It's like saying, here's a kidney transplant. But now you're just going to live the same old way as if you were still on dialysis. And she kept going back to the dialysis every week for um, blood transfusions and stuff and what they do in dialysis. Or that because, she's, because when she was on dialysis, she couldn't drink a lot at all. It'd be like saying, I've got a kidney transplant, but I'm still not going to drink a lot, even though you can. It's like God changes us and we get to live a new way. But we do, don't we? We go back into those ruts. Um, it would be like Dorothy having had her eyes fixed by the wonder of medicine and God's grace and healing on her and for her to still be wearing her glasses. I'm great that Dorothy isn't wearing her glasses right now for the picture. But it would be like looking at things with massive lenses on that helped in the past but just make you blind today. That's what it's like. Do we live by the Spirit? Or do we fall back into the 
things of the flesh. And even, as Stella shared her picture, friends, the light switch is on. The light switch is on. Are we going to turn it up or are we going to leave it on? The power's going to the bulb. Are we going to turn the, the, the dimmer up or are we going to keep turning it down because of the old way? No, we have got a new way to live in Christ Jesus. So that's firstly, we ha- we're not obligated to the flesh anymore. We can live by the Spirit. Secondly, and that goes for this whole series as we're looking at what it means to live a confident life in the Spirit. And that is to go on being filled with the Spirit. Go on being filled with the Spirit. This is not just a one-time experience. We're called to be a people of the Spirit. Paul says in his letter to the Ephesians, go on being filled with the Spirit. It's about knowing his presence and that being the key to believing what is true of us and enjoying the life that we see Paul describe in Romans chapter 8. It's not like you're in, you're sorted, done what I need to do, crack on with life. It's like go on being filled, urgently pursue, look to be filled with the Spirit. You know, sometimes in those moments where you're feeling dry and thirsty, you're like, oh, I need a drink. It's the same in our spiritual life. We need the Spirit of God empowering us and enabling us to live holy lives. And now this may look different to all of us, to each of us. But it does involve one thing for all of us. And that is seeking frequently an infilling of the Holy Spirit. Go on being filled. Getting to know the Spirit. Knowing his characteristics. Knowing who he is. He's a person. A person of God. He's as much God as the Father and the Son. Read about him. There's loads about the Holy Spirit in the Bible, in the Scriptures. You can see who he is and what he does and how he's for us and how he's God with us now. Live, live like he's really there. I think sometimes we don't live as if God's with us. but We need to live as if God's real. Make decisions as if God's real. Expect him to work. Pursue his gifts. Pursue the things of the Spirit. That's what Paul is encouraging us to do. If we're going to live a life in the Spirit, we don't just get our standing with God. We choose to pursue him. We chase after him. We look for things that he wants to do through us. So I want to ask a question. Where do you stand today, friends? Where do you stand today? Firstly, do you know Jesus? Have you given your life to follow him? Have you moved from that kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light? Have you come from the flesh and into the spirit? Have you chosen to set your mind on Christ and the spirit? Is that where you stand today? Do you have assurance, a confidence that you have been filled and are seeking the ongoing infilling of the Holy Spirit? Where do you stand? Are you someone who just loves the Spirit of God? And every day you wake up, you say, Spirit, I thank you that you live in me. Thank you that you're with me. Thank you that you're for me. I'm really looking forward to this day, walking with you. Or do you sort of quickly, on those dry moments, quick, tap in, tap in. Encourage us to be a people that are pursuing regularly the power and the work of the Holy Spirit. If you know that you're not someone who knows Jesus, you've not chosen to follow him, you've not understood what he's done for your life, I just want to encourage you, look to Jesus, look to the scriptures, look to your friends who can tell you about him, look to finding out more about him. Ask him to meet you where you are. Maybe you're in a hopeless situation. Ask him to bring some hope. Say, I know plenty of people have said, Jesus, if you're real, show yourself. I dare you. Ask that question. I dare you. I dare you to say, God, if you're real, prove yourself. If you're someone
someone who knows you just need more of a spirit, I'd encourage you, earnestly desire him. Earnestly seek him. Earnestly look for a relationship with the Holy Spirit. He's God with us. He's good. Pursue him. We're going to have some time where we can pray for each other shortly. Ask someone, I just need to know the Holy Spirit. I just don't know him as I feel I want to. In the Bible, we see the Spirit came upon people on the day of Pentecost when the Spirit was poured out. We see some people ask people to pray for them and they received a, um, an a experience of the Holy Spirit. We see people laying hands on each other. The reality is they were hungry for God. However, however, however it happens, are we hungry for God? Are we hungry for his Spirit? And what happens, friends, when you ask for the Spirit and you're hungry for the Spirit and sort of you think like nothing's happened? That's a bit awkward. It's a bit challenging. I thought, God, I thought you'd want to pour your spirit out. Here I am. Actually, sometimes he wants to build into us the perseverance. Sometimes he wants us to, to, to eagerly desire in a way that we've never done. Maybe he wants us to be on our knees calling upon him. But don't give up. Don't give up. God wants, to know, wants you to know him. And for some of us, like I say, it'll be an amazing, powerful experience. For others, it'll just be just a sense that I know this is true. And I didn't quite get it in the same way as before. Maybe it's just peace or joy. The Bible is not clear. But it's clear that it's, everyone doesn't have the same experience. But we do have the same spirit. The same God who loves us and wants us to know him. So let's look to him. Luke 11. Jesus is talking about asking and knocking and seeking and prayer. And he says, what more will the Father give the Spirit to those who ask? The Spirit is an amazing gift of God that he wants us to take hold of and to receive. So if you are or you have no longer, if you've given your life to Jesus and you're following him, you are no longer obligated to the flesh. But that's not where it stops. If you're not in the flesh, you're in the spirit. So are you pursuing the Holy Spirit? Do you realize that he's a person? Do you realize that he's the person of God who walks with you through life today? Do you want to know what God's plan for your life is? Understand and work. Walk in the power of the spirit. He wants to fill you again with his strength, with his comfort and his power. And that's that bit of that last verse, verse 11, sorry, where Paul reminds us the same power, the same power that raised Christ from the dead lives in you. Isn't that, is that amazing? Is that just me that thinks that's amazing? Jesus defeated sin and death, rose to life, and that same power that brought him back to life, Paul says, God says, lives in us. Here, I'll raise you, I'll raise you raising Jesus from the dead. The same power that raised Jesus from the dead and spoke the universe into being lives in you. It's the spirit of God that lives in us. That isn't life changing. I'm not sure what is. The same power that basically changed the whole of human history lives in you and me as his followers. The same power that spoke the stars into the skies lives in you and me. We can live confidently knowing that's true. Why? Because Jesus said so. And we see it again and again and again as we read the words in our Bibles. It's true. It's what God has done for us. Friends, this is a, this is a game changer. This is a game changer when it comes to doubts. This is a game changer when it comes to, to anxiety and worry. This is a game changer when it comes to to living life for Jesus. I'm not saying it makes it easy. I'm saying it changes the game. Because it changes our perspective. It changes our understanding of what God has done in our lives. That we look to him, that we look to be full of the spirit as we look to live lives of the spirit with our minds set on the spirit, not on the flesh. It changes everything. It doesn't make the circumstances of life, eat life easy. We just know God is with us. Let's live in the good of this amazing truth, friends. Let's live like we believe it. And so as we finish, let me encourage all of us. Let's have our minds set on the Holy Spirit. Let's pursue him. 
Let's eagerly desire the things of the Spirit. Let's step out as he works in and through us. We're going to pray. The band could come back. That would be fantastic.